The Space Shuttle Discovery, named for past ships of exploration, was delivered from its Palmdale, California shuttle factory to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in November 1983. Since then, Discovery has lived up to the historic legacy of its name. It flew to space more times than any other spacecraft. In orbit, it released a telescope to probe the universe and a spacecraft to explore the sun. It carried laboratories to study weightlessness and instruments to study the Earth and its atmosphere. Early in its career, Discovery became the first spacecraft to bring a satellite back to Earth. But perhaps even more compelling than the discoveries it enabled in space is the spirit this vehicle has helped humanity discover on Earth. Its missions include flights that showcased how one-time Cold War adversaries can become long-term friends for exploration. Its flights further expanded space travel beyond boundaries of age, gender, and race, counting among those who flew on it the oldest astronaut, the first female shuttle pilot, and the first African-American spacewalker. But above all, Discovery twice proved that America had the will and the determination to persevere and succeed in the face of devastating grief and tragedy, returning America to space after the Challenger and the Columbia accidents. Discovery is the most accomplished space shuttle ever, set to complete 39 flights in all, amounting to over 5,000 trips around the Earth and more than 300 days in space. Discovery's long history in space began in August 1984. Three, two, one. We have SRB ignition and we have liftoff. Liftoff of mission 41B, the first flight of the orbiter Discovery, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. When it launched from the Kennedy Space Center on STS-41D, Discovery held more than 41,000 pounds of cargo in its payload bay, a shuttle record at the time. The primary cargo consisted of three communications satellites. Among them was LeSat, the first large communication satellite specifically designed to be deployed by a space shuttle. The six-person crew deployed all three satellites and tested an experimental solar array wing to prove technology for possible use on future space stations. On its second mission, STS-51A in November 1984, Discovery headed to orbit to deploy two more satellites and retrieve two others. The spectacular retrievals would be accomplished by astronauts using jetpacks called the Man Maneuvering Units, or MMUs. The retrieval of the first satellite, Palapa B-2, took some improvisation. Spacewalker Joe Allen first captured the satellite with a device called a Stinger and guided it to Discovery's payload bay. After experiencing initial problems, the crew teamed up to manually berth it in the payload bay itself. All right, we got her. Man, do you want me to move across? Did she get yours too, Joe? The big latch yours? Fine to latch. The mission marked the final time the MMUs were used. In 1985, Discovery became the only shuttle to fly four missions in the same year. One of those, STS-51D, included two more satellite deploys. Utah Senator Jake Garn was a mission specialist on the crew, becoming the first sitting member of Congress to fly in space. During landing, Discovery suffered a blown front tire and brake damage. The incident prompted NASA to move future shuttle landings to Edwards Air Force Base in California until nose wheel steering and brake improvements were implemented some five years later. The tragic loss of the shuttle Challenger and its seven crew members stunned the world in January 1986. In its aftermath, NASA turned to Discovery to return Americans to space with a myriad of safety improvements. With the world watching, Discovery Three, launched on two, September 29, 1988. And liftoff! Liftoff! Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. Roger roll, Discovery. Thank you.
During the four-day STS-26 return to flight mission, Discovery's crew deployed a NASA tracking and data relay satellite, identical to the one lost aboard Challenger. A host of experiments were performed before Discovery made a triumphant return to Earth. Thank you, touchdown. Discovery, welcome back. A great ending to the new beginning. In 1990, Discovery flew a pair of missions to extend humankind's vision into the cosmos. In April, Discovery carried the Hubble Space Telescope to orbit on STS-31, releasing it at the highest altitude flown by a shuttle to that date, almost 380 miles. Hubble's 20 years of observing the universe have yielded breathtaking images and a better understanding of our place in the cosmos. Discovery would be called upon to visit and upgrade the telescope on two subsequent missions, STS-82 in 1997 and STS-103 in 1999. In October 1990, Discovery launched the European Space Agency-built Ulysses spacecraft. The robotic probe would make unprecedented observations of the sun's polar regions for the next 18 years. When Discovery was built in the early 1980s, few would have envisioned its crews or destinations, including a program that began on its 18th flight, STS-60, in February 1994. The mission was the first cooperative human spaceflight between NASA and the Russian Federal Space Agency of the Shuttle Mir program. Discovery's crew included Russian cosmonaut Sergei Krikalov, and the commander of the historic mission would go on to become NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden. Almost a year to the day after Krikalov's flight, Discovery would make history again as the international partnership progressed. On mission STS-63, Discovery's six-person crew included cosmonaut Vladimir Titov, mission commander Jim Weatherby, and first-ever female shuttle pilot Eileen Collins guided Discovery to within 40 feet of the Russian Mir space station to certify procedures that would be used later for the first docking of a shuttle to a space station. We are bringing our nations closer together. The next time we approach, we will shake your hand and together we will lead our world into the next millennium. It was the first rendezvous of a space shuttle with Mir. The mission also saw astronaut Bernard Harris become the first African-American to walk in space. Discovery would not visit Mir again until June 1998 on mission STS-91. On that flight, more than three years after its initial rendezvous, Discovery would make its first docking to the complex, but would be the last shuttle to visit Mir. Congratulations on an outstanding rendezvous and uh, an historical ninth docking with Mir. It was beautiful to watch from down here. You have a very light touch. We really enjoyed the whole thing. Congratulations. As Discovery undocked, the Shuttle Mir program, which had seen nine shuttle missions docked to the complex, ended, setting the stage for the start of the assembly of the International Space Station. And lift off of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. The October 1998 flight of Discovery on STS-95 was primarily a mission to conduct life science experiments. But all eyes were on 77-year-old astronaut and U.S. Senator John Glenn, who in 1962 became the first American to orbit the Earth. Glenn was a member of the crew and a test subject for a host of experiments that studied aging. Glenn's space flight on STS-95 made him the oldest person to fly in space. Hello, Houston. This is PS2. I mean, let me get sprung out of the mid-deck for a little while. We're just going by Hawaii, and that is absolutely gorgeous. The best part is to do a trite old statement, zero G, and I feel fine. Two years later, on October 11, 2000, a magnificent night launch by Discovery, accented by a full moon, marked the historic 100th flight of the space shuttle program. STS-92 was a 12-day mission to the fledgling International Space Station. 
Discovery's crew completed four spacewalks to install the Z-1 truss and the pressurized mating adapter 3, or PMA-3. Z-1 was eventually used as a temporary location for the station's first set of solar arrays. PMA-3 also would provide an available port for future dockings. In February 2003, the world again mourned as the shuttle Columbia and her seven crew members were lost during re-entry. America resolved to continue the shuttle program and again improve the safety of flight. And NASA again turned to Discovery to return the nation to space on mission STS-114, commanded by Eileen Collins. Discovery launch director. Discovery here, go ahead. Okay, Eileen, our long wait may be over. Uh, and so on behalf of the many millions of people who believe so deeply in what we do, good luck, Godspeed, and have a little fun up there. And thanks to you, to the launch team, and to everybody in the shuttle program, the crew is go for launch. And liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, beginning America's new journey. The STS-114 mission to the International Space Station included new procedures to ensure the shuttle heat shield would be in good condition for the trip home. Among them, a first-of-its-kind backflip as Discovery approached the station to enable the station crew to capture high-resolution imagery of the shuttle's heat shield. The crew conducted three spacewalks. On one of those EVAs, astronaut Steve Robinson made the first repair to the exterior of a spacecraft in flight removing two gap fillers which were protruding in between some of Discovery's thermal tiles. Experts were concerned that the protruding material could have affected heat flow over the thermal shield during the return home. NASA's final mission of 2006 was expected to be one of its most challenging. Discovery's STS-116 flight to the International Space Station called for the installation of the P-5 truss segment and a major overhaul of the station's electrical power system. Problems arose while retracting one of the station's solar arrays, which was to be relocated on a future flight. During the retraction, the array snagged. During two spacewalks, astronauts Bob Kerbeam, Sonny Williams, and Christer Fugelsang assisted in the retraction by hand using a combination of techniques. The troubleshooting worked, and the solar array was folded. During the work, Kirby became the first person to complete four spacewalks during a single mission. In October 2007, Discovery headed back to the space station. STS-120 marked the first time that two female commanders were in space together. Discovery Commander Pam Melroy and Station Commander Peggy Whitson, the first woman to command the space station. The mission included installation of the Harmony module on the station and relocation of the truss and solar array that had been folded on STS-116. The 105-foot-long solar array tore while unfurling. After studying the situation, Mission Control devised a solution which called for the crew to make cufflink-type devices out of wire straps to mend and stabilize the array. Scott Parazinski and Doug Wheelock installed the devices and the array was deployed. We've got deployed discrete. Two deployed discrete. Yay! All right. Beautiful. Great news. Beautiful. What an accomplishment. Nice teamwork. The 15-day mission was Discovery's longest. On STS-124 in May 2008, Discovery headed back to the station to deliver the centerpiece of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's experiment laboratory, Kibo, which means hope in Japanese. STS-124 was the second of three shuttle flights to deliver elements of Kibo, the station's largest laboratory. JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide and NASA astronaut Karen Nyberg installed the module and also became the first to float into it after its hatch was opened. In March 2009, Discovery traveled to the station on mission STS-119. The flight installed the final set of solar arrays for the complex, bringing it to full power capability. When its flights are completed, 180 people will have flown aboard Discovery. The fleet